the top level is how we interact with a Prolog system. The Prolog standard defines what a top level is. It's a process whereby a Prolog processor repeatedly inputs and executes queries. And it also states in a node that it doesn't define or require a processor to support the concept of a top level. In fact, the entire user environment, such as editor, debugger, and so on, is out of scope of the Prolog standard. So a conforming Prolog system may or may not have a top level. At the same time, of course, the top level is an essential feature of virtually all Prolog systems. And in fact, all Prolog systems I know do provide a top level. And a top level can also be useful in Prolog applications, not just in Prolog systems. Because we may want to provide a way for users of our application to ask queries about stored data and about relations between the data or about logical consequences of relations that users provide. Or, for example, we may want to implement a client-server architecture where clients ask a Prolog server over a network for answers to queries. And in such cases, we may want to implement in our application something very similar to a Prolog top level, maybe with fewer or maybe with more features. And therefore, we expect the Prolog standard to provide all facilities that are necessary to express what we mean with a top level and to portably express it in the sense that it should run in the same way in all conforming product systems. So what does a sensible top level interaction look like? Let's consider an example. For instance, let's open a terminal and start, for example, a scryer prolog. And this is how the system greets us with question mark dash. So this is the top level of scryer prolog. It's a completely conforming top level because the top level is out of scope of the ISO standard and we can use it to post queries. For instance, if we ask, are there any characters X in a string ABC? So we can read question mark dash as, is it the case that, or does it hold that? And conceptually, question mark dash is part of the input. So even though the system writes it for us, it acts as if we had written it. Because what we state here is not a fact about the predicate member. That is, we are not stating here a horn clause with an empty body, but rather we state here a horn clause with an empty head. This is called a gold clause. And if we read it logically, then what we actually state here is something is not the case. Because we say goal implies the empty set, that is false. And this can only hold if goal is itself false. So in this concrete case, from a logical perspective, we state there is no X for which this predicate holds. And again, from a logical perspective, what Prolog does is it tries to refute this statement by deriving a contradiction between this statement and the things that are known about the predicate. So we assert there is no such X and Prolog, if it finds a solution, shall say, that's wrong, there is such an X, namely such and such. And of course, we don't have to think about it in this way. We can also think about it in terms of querying the system, in the sense that we ask, are there any X for which this holds? And Pollock shall tell us whether that's the case. And that's maybe the more conventional view of such an interaction, to see it in terms of questions and answers instead of assertions and refutations. And that's why we call the input a query. The standard defines a query as a goal given as interactive input to the top level. And in response, we get an answer from the system. For instance, in this case, when we post the query, we get an existence error because the predicate member is nowhere defined. And a top level may of course offer many features that make the interaction more convenient, such as completion, a history, shortcuts, and so on. For instance, in Scryer Prolog, if we press tab, then we can cycle through sensible completions. Such as in this case, if we now press tab, then the top level expands this to use module. And by pressing tab again, we can cycle through completions. In this case, there's only one. And again, by pressing tab, we can complete this to library. And we do this in this case because member is defined in the lists library. So we load the library. And as answer, we get true. Procedurally speaking, this succeeds. So, now that we've loaded the lists module, we want to post again our query from above. And in Scryer Prolog, we have Emacs style shortcuts available. So for example, we can press Control P to get back the previous query ready for posting. And by repeating Control P, 
we can go back further in history. So in our case, this is the query we want to post. And when we post it, we get an answer from the product system. And in this case, the answer is a solution because this is an answer substitution that makes all variables ground. So this is a solution, a concrete ground term for X that makes the relation hold. And now we have several options. For example, we can press space to see the next answer, which is again a solution, X is B in this case. And we have X is C as the last solution. And we have a small problem with terminology here, because this entire output is also called an answer, just as the answers to the previous queries. But in this case, it's not an atomic goal, as in the cases before, but a disjunction of goals. And we have the same terminological problem when we speak about goals, right? Because this entire disjunction is a goal and each of the disjuncts is also a goal. So in this case, the answer is a disjunction. And it says either X is A or X is B or X is C. And there are no other solutions. So this false here is simply redundant. And it arises only in this case because there was a redundant choice point. And a better implementation of member could avoid it. So with a better implementation of member or a better engine, we might see this answer, which is declaratively equivalent to what we got, namely this, with false at the end. And that's also a frequent question from Prolog beginners, because they see this false at the end and then ask, why does my predicate fail? And the answer is, this only means that there are no more solutions and false is simply the identity element of this junction. What's much more interesting here is the layout because this is an ideal layout for a disjunction because the semicolon appears at the start of a line, never at the end of a line, where it's easily mistaken for a comma. So this layout adheres to the prolog style guides for disjunctions. And as mentioned from a logical perspective, this is a refutation because with the query we've stated here, member of X and ABC implies the empty set, that is the goal implies false and hence does not hold. And Prolog tells us that contradicts what we know about this relation, because from the definition of the predicate member, one can deduce that there are these solutions for X. So the things Prolog knows about the predicate member refute the assertion that there are no solutions. And as answer, we get concrete solutions that make the goal and the query hold. And as in the cases above, the answer is declaratively equivalent to the query. So we can simply take the answer and post it as a query. And in response, we get the same solutions as before, X is A or X is B and so on. Of course, now we already know the answers and we can press, for example, return to stop the enumeration. So in response, Prolog indicates with dot 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 that answers are potentially omitted here and we are back to posting queries. And if you load, for example, the CLPZ library, then we can post constraints over integers like this. For instance, when we ask, is there an integer x greater than three, then Prolog tells us, yes, if there is an integer that is four or greater. So that's not a concrete solution as before, but rather a conditional solution. It's only a solution if this constraint can be satisfied. And of course, in this case, it's easy to see that the constraint can be satisfied. And that in fact, what we see here reflects infinitely many concrete solutions x is 4, x is 5, and so on. And we call such an answer a residual constraint and also a residual goal, because this must hold for the goal in the query to hold. So as before, the answer is declaratively equivalent to the query, right? I mean, it's really the same for all these queries. We put in a prolog term and in response, we get a prolog term that is in a sense equivalent to what we stated. For instance, in this case, what we stated amounts to an existence error because the predicate member isn't defined at this time. So in a sense, we could have just thrown an existence error ourselves and it would have amounted to the same result. Okay, in the second case, the answer is not entirely equivalent to the query, but only because what we posted here yields a side effect in the sense that it changes the state of the prolog system because after this query, the lists library is now loaded. From a logical perspective, without the side effect, the query amounts to the same thing as posting true, because it simply holds. 
And conceptually, it's entirely the same as before. We put in a product term and we get a product term back. Also here, we put in a product term and we get a product term out. And again, the answer is a goal that's declaratively equivalent to the query. And each answer is written as a read term. This means a term followed by an end token, namely dot. So answers are stated as read terms. And queries are also read terms, product terms followed by dot. For instance, this is a valid product term because a question mark dash is a prefix operator. And it's a read term because it's followed by dot. And this means that we can, for example, take such a top-level interaction and read the sequence of terms with built-in predicates such as read. So we can also easily write and verify test cases for how a top-level ought to behave. So we've now seen a sample interaction and the basic invariant of an ideal top-level interaction is clear from these examples. Namely, we post queries as product terms and we get answers as product terms. And the answers are declaratively equivalent to the queries. So there is a nice conceptual simplicity to the top-level interaction. We put terms in and we get terms out. And this holds at least for the pure subset of Prolog. For instance, if the goal has side effects, such as loading a library as we've seen, or it produces output on the terminal, then this equivalence between queries and answers no longer holds. But a top level can very well embed additional information as comments within read terms. The predicate time is such an example in this system. If we load the time library and then ask, how long does it take Prolog to determine whether this holds, then we get a solution and another solution emitted as a read term and embedded in this read term, we get these single line comments where Prolog shows the time it took to find a solution. So in this way, additional information can be embedded in answers. Now, let's think about how we can actually describe a top level in Prolog. That is, let's for the moment not rely on a specific Prolog system, but rather describe what we mean with a top level using ideally portable Prolog code. For instance, we may start with a predicate, say top level, which shall hold if it successfully reads a goal as a Prolog term, the goal succeeds, it reports as answer all bindings for variables and the predicate top level holds. So the same again, read a goal, run the goal, report the bindings and so on. So as a first attempt, this seems plausible enough. However, this isn't sufficient, at least not yet, because first of all, read introduces fresh variables. For instance, when we ask Prolog to read a term, and then enter, for example, f of x and y, followed by dot, so a read term, then we get a term with fresh variables. So we don't see x and y in the answer, but rather new variables, underscore a and underscore b. And for reporting solutions, we of course need to know the variable names that were used in the query. But the name of a variable is a meta-logical property. And Prolog, from a logical perspective, that is regarded as a theorem prover, doesn't care at all about the names. So to get the names of variables, we need something extra logical, like the variable names option for read term. If we use this option, then Prolog gives us a correspondence between variable names, specified as atoms, and the actual first order variables that occur in the read term. For instance, if we now again enter the read term f of x and y, then Prolog gives us the term as before, where fresh variables appear instead of x and y, and via this correspondence, we can also reason about the names of the variables as they appeared in the read term, which we'd use as query. So the first change we make here is to use read term with the variable names option to read the query. And this gives us, as VNs, such a mapping of name variable pairs in a sense. And as mentioned, we'd of course use this mapping when reporting variable bindings in answers. Because when emitting bindings, we'd like to print the names of variables as they were used in the query, not just fresh variable names. And in this way, we have access to all variable names that appeared in the query, also to those of variables that have become instantiated during execution of the query. And we of course need all these names when reporting bindings. And there's a corresponding variable names option for writing terms. So this is well within the scope of the prolog standard. Another thing we expect from a top level is of course that it reports 
alternatives and also that it reports failure. So in case goal fails, we of course don't expect the predicate top level to fail, but rather that it tells us that goal has failed. And one way to show alternative answers is to force backtracking via false and report all alternatives. And further to turn this into a disjunction where in case goal fails, we report that there are no solutions or more generally, no more solutions because we reach this branch also in case there were solutions after forced backtracking has exhausted all alternatives. So in total, this reports all solutions, zero, one or many, and then reports that there are no more solutions. And after reporting an answer, it's sensible to wait, for example, for a key press and only then report the next answer. Otherwise we may get too many solutions at once and too fast. So this now begins to resemble a product top level. We read a goal, invoke the goal, report bindings, wait for a key press, report alternatives via force backtracking, and after all alternatives are reported in this way, admit that there are no more solutions. And we can refine it in various ways. For instance, many product systems provide the predicate setup call cleanup, and we can use it to detect whether choice points remain. This isn't yet part of the product standard, but many product systems already provide it. And maybe the most common use of this predicate is to prevent resource leaks by making sure, for example, that every stream that is opened is always closed, regardless of whether a goal succeeds, fails, or throws an exception. So no matter what occurs in goal, stream is reliably closed at the earliest possibility, also if no more backtracking is possible, that is, no choice points remain. And there's a closely related predicate, call cleanup, which we can express with setup call cleanup, but not vice versa. Because as in the case above, we may need to refer during the cleanup phase to the stream we've opened in the setup phase. And call cleanup can't express such a setup phase. But to detect whether choice points remain, call cleanup is in fact enough. Because for that, we don't need a setup phase, so we can simply use true. And as mentioned, the cleanup is called at the earliest opportunity, notably when no choice points remain. So to reify this information, that no alternatives remain, that is to make this information accessible within Prolog, we can use here a unification such as the variable that for deterministic shall be bound to the atom yes. Okay. And as a test, we simply check whether that is identical to the atom yes. And this succeeds if and only if no choice points and therefore no alternatives remain. And as mentioned, setup call cleanup isn't yet standard prolog, but for example, Scryer prolog provides it in the ISOX library and many other prolog systems also already provide it. And in all systems where it's available, we can simply use this pattern and wrap the execution of the given goal in setup call cleanup. And now we can take the obtained information, namely whether another solution can follow, into account when reporting the bindings. And of course, ideally, we only wait for a key press if another solution can follow. So this part would benefit from further consideration. Because if no further solution can follow, then we should simply read the next query instead of waiting for a key press. And I leave this as a challenge. And while we are at it, regarding this get single charm, a top level can of course use this to provide sensible actions. So instead of simply waiting for any key press, a top level could introduce dedicated keys, for example, to show the next answer. This could be space n semicolon for a disjunction and so on, or to stop the enumeration, for example, with return dot and so on. Also useful would be a dedicated key like a to show all answers. This is useful because wrong, that is unintended answers, often show up after a few intended solutions. And so it's convenient to easily see all answers one after the other without having to press space over and over. Or W to write all terms unabbreviated and so on. So these are useful actions a top level may provide and in fact Scryer Prolog does provide all of them. And at the same time, there's clearly a trade-off here because the top level should be easy to understand and use. And therefore we must be careful not to provide too many options. In case of doubt, better keep it simple. Now, 
One other feature we need is a predicate like copy term with three arguments so that we can obtain residual goals. This is also not yet part of the prolog standard, but several prolog systems already provide it. Copy term of x, y and g is creates y as a copy without constraints of the term x and also yields g is as a list of goals that, when called, impose equivalent constraints on y. So it's like the standard predicate copy term with two arguments, except that it also lets us reason about the constraints that a variable is involved in. And we can do this in particular by simply unifying the copy with the original term x. Because then we simply get as g's the constraints that x is involved in. So copy term will likely also play a role when writing a top level. And of course a top level will likely emit question mark dash before reading the query, which is easy to add using for example write as a side effect. So the basic shape of a rudimentary top level implementation could look like this. Now let's think about what we expect from an ideal prolog top level. Well, we have several desiderata. Maybe most importantly, the basic invariant we have mentioned should hold. That is, answers are declaratively equivalent to queries. This is a feature we've seen in the sample interaction and this is what allows easy testing of answers, reasoning about answers and so on. Further, it should be convenient and fun to use. So, for example, it could provide convenient shortcuts for posting queries, such as completion and history, as we've seen. And at the same time, it should stay simple and shouldn't provide too many features. Rather, it should provide just the right features to make it fun to use. For instance, if we have such a query, which has infinitely many solutions and produces infinitely many answers on backtracking, then one thing we already notice here are the beautiful names of singleton variables in answers, such as underscore a, underscore b, underscore c, and so on. So that's something that the top level should definitely do. Use beautiful, easily readable variable names in its output, also for singleton variables. And the overall interaction could still be better, because getting these answers was a bit tedious. Space, 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 and so on. What the top level could have done for us is something like this. That is, to automatically show us five answers at a time. So immediately show the first five answers and then show another five or let us stop. So this is something that no prolog system currently does, but for example, the prolog teaching environment Gupo already does it. And I certainly recommend to implement it in systems, simply because it's so convenient. And Scryer Prolog has something that's a bit similar, but not quite the same, by pressing F to get up to the next multiple of five solutions. The drawback is that first we have to press F, so we have to do more work. And second, we also need to remember that such a binding even exists. So it also makes the top level more complex and it's definitely best to remove this again once such a better method becomes available. Now, you may say, what if the solutions are very costly to compute? So we can't immediately get five at once. For instance, consider a situation like this. The prolog system shows the first two solutions and still tries to find the third one. And one nice thing we notice here is the semicolon. Because by showing it, the system can indicate, as in this case, that it's already searching for a solution and that no user input is necessary at this point. So that's a good output in this situation because it lets us immediately see the state of the system. It's now searching for a third solution. And in such cases where solutions take a long time to find, a good top level could, for example, yes, try to show five answers at a time and interrupt the search if the user presses a key. For instance, in this case, a key press could bring us back to stating queries. And to implement this in Prolog, a system must provide a mechanism to detect pending input. So it's not enough to simply read a character and wait. No, the system must provide a way to detect that the input is pending, also while it searches for solutions. 
And for example, Scry Apollo doesn't have this at the moment. So I leave adding this as a challenge. Another issue that's worth thinking about is how do we handle truncated output? For instance, suppose we ask, what are the verses in the first chapter of the book of Genesis? And as answer, we ideally get, as discussed, the first five solutions. And by pressing space, we could ask for the next five solutions. Or we could press return to stop the enumeration, okay? And we can already sense that there's an issue here because these strings are truncated. And this issue also arises if we consider specific verses. For instance, let's consider verse one in chapter one. Here it is. Or rather, not quite, because what we see here is suboptimal. First, what we see here isn't a true solution. Rather, it's a term that is distinct from the actual solution, because this is again a truncated string. But it's indistinguishable from a string that looks just like this. So that's bad. This is purportedly the solution, but it's not the actual solution. It's in fact also highly misleading in this case, because I wasn't even present in the beginning, let alone create anything. And second, how do we get to see the actual solution? Because we are now back to posting queries. So we didn't even have a chance to tell the top level that we want to see the actual solution. Because there's no choice point in this case, that is, the goal succeeds deterministically, and the top level simply reports the unique solution and asks us for the next query. Well, one way to see the actual solution is to use the history feature of the top level, control P, and then to manually introduce a superfluous choice point. So, for instance, we could artificially turn this into a declaratively equivalent disjunction just to introduce a choice point. And now we actually hope that the top level is implemented suboptimally and doesn't give us five answers at the time, but rather gives us one solution and then asks us what to do. And in fact, Scry Apollo currently does it this way and moreover gives us a way to see the entire solution by pressing W here. Okay? And we can press P to get back the truncated output or press space as usual to get the next solution. And in this case, there's no other solution. So that's all quite bad. First, we saw an answer that looked like a solution, but actually wasn't a solution. It was truncated. Second, we had to go back and modify the query, which is suboptimal. And third, we've now introduced a superfluous choice point. And the main question we have here is how to do better. And I don't know, and I invite you to think about it. Another desideratum we have for an ideal top level is that it should be written in Prolog. That's because, first of all, implementing a top level in Prolog is a great test for a Prolog system. In particular, does it provide all the needed features, such as the variable names option for read term and write term, setup call cleanup, and for constraints, copy term with three arguments to reason about residual goals, and call residue vars. What's that for? Well, let's go back to the sample interaction and let's consult the Polo code directly from standard input. And we can do this with this dedicated syntax, a list with the atom user. And now we can specify Polo code. For instance, let's define the predicate f, which will hold if there's an integer x that's greater than y, and at the same time, smaller than y. So this can't hold, of course. And we finish this with return and control D. And now we're back to posting queries. And let's now ask, does F hold? Yes, F succeeds unconditionally. That's wrong, right? F can't hold, and therefore the answer should be false. And such cases arise because constraint propagation is incomplete in general, in the sense that it fails to detect all cases that can't hold. And for example, for sufficiently powerful constraints over integers, that's necessarily so, due to Matthias-Sevich's theorem. And to handle such cases correctly, what we need from a prolog system is a way to obtain all constraints that were posted during the execution of a goal and which are now still pending. And for example, Scryapolog provides such a predicate in library ads. Namely, 
they mentioned predicate coal residue vars, which takes as its argument a polar goal such as F, and in its second argument, it yields a list of variables that still have constraints attached, even if these variables only occur internally in the cold predicates and aren't directly accessible as arguments. So for instance, in this case, we obtain the variable underscore B and the top level also shows its pending constraints as residual goals. And in fact, this answer is somewhat surprising in itself because we expected two variables instead of one, but at least all the needed information is now present to see that there are pending constraints and this is different from succeeding unconditionally. And this execution mode should obviously be the default. So for correctness, a product top level should implicitly wrap every posted query and call residue vars and always report all pending constraints. So ideally, even if we only post F, the pending constraints are shown. But that would be extremely inefficient, right? Well, yes, of course, if call residue vars is inefficient. The good news is that if a top level wraps all queries in call residue vars, then that's a great incentive for implementers to make the construct fast. So that's another good reason to use this by default, because prolog constructs are a bit like organic muscles. When we use them often, they become stronger. And while we are at it, what is this? It's an answer, right? That's for sure. We got it in response to a query. However, what's unusual here is that this answer doesn't express any solutions, because these constraints can't be satisfied. So it's declaratively equivalent to false, but the constraint solver hasn't detected this. It's incomplete. So what should we call this? Maybe a pseudo solution. Well, we currently don't have a good word for this, so that's something worth thinking about. And other features that could be useful are being able to detect pending input as discussed and timeouts or inference limits, especially to test the top-level code also for queries that don't terminate, and maybe also other features. And all these features that are needed to implement the top-level are of course good candidates for inclusion in the product standard, because we want to implement the top-level not only for some specific product system, but ideally in portable product code, which runs in all conforming systems. And ideally, a top-level implementation should itself be testable via queries. So we should be able to automatically ascertain that the top level yields the intended answers. And for this, it could be useful to describe the relation between queries and answers, for example, with a DCG. And when thinking about improvements to the top level, we keep in mind that it's one of the first things that Prolog programmers see. And it's also how they interact with the Prolog system all the time. It's explained in Prolog books, and we often see transcripts of top-level interactions. And therefore, top-level behavior is quite deeply ingrained. And so we expect resistance against all changes and also against improvements. And at the same time, we also keep in mind that improvements are desirable and that they are also possible. And we know this because several Prolog systems have already improved in this area. For instance, when a query fails, some systems used to respond with no or something like it. This isn't a read term and also not a standard prolog predicate. So this violates the basic invariant we mentioned. And some of these systems then improved and now say for example false is answer. And from here it's only a small change to get an even better answer like this with better indentation. Or take for example exceptions. The ideal answer is to state an exception as a goal, like throw or type error and so on. And indeed newer systems such as Scryer Prolog already do this. And for a query with multiple solutions, we are maybe used to an answer like this. Well, we may be used to it, but it's bad, because this is terrible layout for a disjunction, since semicolon looks much like a comma, and so this looks like a conjunction instead of a disjunction. So what we want is rather this layout as discussed. 
Yes, maybe we are not used to it, but it's a lot better. And it can still be improved because this dot is in a sense not correct because this answer omits a solution, namely x is t. So what we want is rather a clear indication that there may be more solutions and then a dot to make it a return. Now, how do we find such improvements? Well, it's certainly tempting to appeal to principles, such as we put goals in and we get equivalent goals out. However, principles alone are not enough because we can really justify anything by choosing appropriate principles. For example, we may just as well uphold the principle we do everything in exactly the same way as it was in the past. Or we do exactly what we do. That's also a principle, right? It's just one that doesn't help us. And indeed, the need for principles could also indicate a lack of righteousness. What we rather do is we follow the faint whisper that always tells us we can do better. And I think the best product implementers will have very sensitive ears, so to say, to hear this whisper. And at the same time, we'll implement and defend such improvements with an iron fist. And there are many things we can do and help with. For instance, we could start by thinking about terminology, such as, is there a better name for what we called pseudo-solution? Or as we said, we call this an answer. And what should this be called? It's a solution in this case. And what do we call such a disjunct in general? 